Welcome to the big picture. I'm Phil Arno. President of the United States, for the first time in history, has been indicted for a crime. 34, actually. And there's a lot of uh, things to sort out on this one. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, to say the least, to lawyers, to politicians, and I'm sure to people like you and me who don't have a legal background. But thankfully, to help sort us out, uh, we have Paul Cambria, who should understand everything that's going on. Right, Paul? Welcome Absolutely. to the show. <laughs> 100%. Um, first of all, this is kind of historic in that uh, a president, a former president, a presidential candidate, uh, the circumstances are bizarre. This, this is a... Uh, a charge uh, that's going to have an effect on an upcoming presidential election. It's, uh, there's all kinds of ways of, to look at this. Is it uh, an improvement to the criminal justice system in that nobody is above the law? Or is it a shadow on the criminal justice system in that it's being used for political purposes? How do you look at this? Well, I think that maybe the excuse for it is going to be that no one's above the law, but uh, I think the general thinking will be that this is politically motivated. Uh, you know, where it is, where the prosecution is, who's doing it, the background of who's doing it, the charges. Uh, so I don't think, uh, you know, it's not going to do much for the legal system. Um, We'll see, see what the judges do. There are a lot of problems with this indictment. And, uh, you know, the lawyers, obviously, that's their job to sort them out. So that'll be the next stage. Well, you know, if this was a clear cut crime, you know, he, he robbed a store or he got caught strangling somebody, you know, and it was a murder case or whatever, this would be a lot simpler to digest. This the way it stands is so confusing and such a, a case that's hard to sort out that it really can go either way in, in depending on how you view Trump and how you view the, the legal system. Um, I guess your, your opinions are going to vary just to start with because of where you stand. But as you look into it and you cut through all the, the facts and figures, it, it's going to boil down to, is this a case of substance? Well, look, prosecution says it's very simple. Um, he falsified business records calling what was a payment to Stormy, Dan Stormy Daniels as legal expense, uh, and he did it to protect his place, if you will, in the election. I mean, that's their position. And, and then they cover that with, no one's above the law, all right? On the other hand, the defense is saying, well, who are you kidding here? You don't want this guy to be president. He might have a shot at being president. He still has some kind of, you know, crazy popularity out there with a lot of people. And you want a Democrat to be a president, and so you're going to knock him out of the race. Uh, and the defense is, you know, the defense is going to be, uh, he didn't do this with the intent to influence an election. He did it to save his family from embarrassment. That's why he closed, you know, tried to stop her from saying things that are salacious and so on. So that's where that is. But even before we get to that, we have to look at the, the document itself, the charge itself. There really are a lot of problems with this. I mean, not only is it, you know, presidential in the sense that there no president or former president has been prosecuted, but just the way they go about it. For example, they say, well, it's a falsified business expense. Well, that's a misdemeanor. Well, how do you get it to a felony? Well, if it was done to further another crime or to conceal another crime, that raises it to a felony. Now we look at the charges, they don't identify what that other crime is. So that gives the defense lawyer a, you know, an easy opening to say, 
The grand jury charges people. You have a constitutional right to a grand jury. And the grand jury never said what that charge was. So <coughs> this is not a valid indictment. The grand jury has to say what the charge is, not the prosecutor. It isn't one of these, well, I'm the prosecutor, I'll keep it to myself and spring it on them at the trial. It doesn't work that way. So in other words, they can't say later on what the, what makes it a felony. They have to say it at, at the outset. Well, that's right. The grand jury charges <laughs> people, and you have a constitutional right to be charged by a grand jury. And here they're going to say the grand jury never specified the so-called escalator here, the crime that supposedly is being furthered. And so it's not a valid indictment. That's part of it. The other part they're going to say just from the rules <clears throat> of indictments and how they're constructed, you know, this big, long factual statement really is not something that you see in indictments. Indictments have a clear and concise <clears throat> factual statement. Here's the charge without a lot of evidentiary stuff. So the defense lawyers are going to say that should be struck because it's like a summation written for the jury. It's not fair and it's not what indictments do. All right, so that's that part. Then they've got statute of limitations issue because there's a five-year statute on felonies. And they'll say the defense statute ran. Prosecution will say, no, we had a pause because of COVID. And secondly, you live in Florida. And so that tolls the statute while you're out of the state. So they're going to go back and forth on that. And, you know, there's just so much here to work with from the defense standpoint. Well, I think what you have just said trumps everything, no pun intended, <laughs> but if if there's no felony involved, if they haven't named a felony, doesn't that basically introduce cause to dismiss right off the bat? Yeah, because you're going to say, I'm entitled to be indicted by a grand jury, not by a prosecutor later on and fill in the blank sort of thing. And the indictment is not valid. Uh, and all the other reasons that I indicated, too, to ch challenge the indictment, the statute, and so on. But yeah, the primary thing is the so-called escalator is not identified. And it can't be filled in by a so-called bill of particulars, which is something that they can provide. But it can't fill in a, a defective indictment. So when they get before the judge, as they did the other day, and, and laid out the, the charges, <clears throat> that's basically providing information for the defense so that the, the defense can prepare their case. And if they don't lay out all the details of the indictment, you know, what the felony is and all the, the other details, then the defense can't prepare their case. Well, then they violate their right to be indicted by a grand jury and to be given a specificity of what the charge is, which is called due process. So there's a statutory rule, there's a constitutional rule, actually two. One is you have a right to be indicted by a grand jury, and two, you have a right to due process, which is notice and then a right to be heard. Notice requires what's the charge? What's the escalator? So that's that's why this this indictment is definitely subject to challenge. Okay, well we've got about three minutes left in this segment, which this is going to lead me to the the bigger picture, so to say, and that is, you know, you've been a lawyer forever, and I've talked to lawyers about forever but, but <laughs> in different venues, and and I, the reality is that. When you bring uh, a case in front of a jury, it, you know, it, this is not official, but this is the real world. It matters where you try a case. J various juries are uh, slanted in various directions if you want a specific result for a case. In New York City, and there's been a lot of talk about this, um, it's not a very friendly venue for Donald Trump. Um, the, neither the judge nor a, a, the jury pool would be um, favorable 
for a Trump um, trial. Given that atmosphere. Maybe. maybe. Well, uh, th just in, in theory, okay, um, given that, that uh, atmosphere, a, tr a, a, a judge that's, that's handled Trump-related cases and ruled against the Trump organization in every instance, um, a jury pool that's, uh, that's basically voted against Trump in like eight to, to, to two, uh, 80 percent basically throughout all the elections. Is there a chance that that judge will act with um, the law as it should be, or will his bias overrule what the law dictates? Do judges do that? Well, I'm sure that there, you know, there's always somebody who does something that, you know, shouldn't happen. I don't know anything about this <laughs> judge, but I do know that there's going to be such scrutiny of the proceedings by people who are experts in the law and commentators on a daily basis that I think any judge is going to be on their best behavior. And where the problem arises is if in the, in the margins where there's discretion, if they, you know, will they exercise it against ruling in Trump's favor or for, that's a little different. That's an area where they have discretion and so you can't criticize them because it was within the realm of decision. If it's something that's obvious, all right, the commentators all around the country are going to be blasting that judge. So whatever they might do on their daily, daily routine is one thing. This case is going to have the mic microscope on it. So I think, you know, he'll have a fair proceeding just because so many eyes will be on it. However, jurors, now, is it <clears throat> thought that there are more liberal jurors in New York City than there are, for example, in Staten Island where he'd like to go? Who knows? You don't know who's going to come into that panel. You could have a bunch of business people in there who are very conservative Republicans. You don't know that. I mean, his ideal juror are the ones that walk in with the red hats on, obviously, right? And if they're smart, they'll leave their red hats at, at home because they'll never be picked as jurors if they don't. And there will be some of that. There will be people who want to be on this jury and will say things in voir dire, which is the jury selection process, so that they don't tip their hand and they get on the jury. We see that in cases all the time. But it'll really happen in this case. And so in the end, if you get conservative <coughs> jurors, they're going to swing his way more likely than in the prosecution's way. And he's got a good defense here to say, look, I have an extended family. I have all these businesses. The last thing I need is a Stormy Daniels out there saying that I had some kind of affair with her and so on. So that was my intent. I was confident in the election. I didn't have to worry about that. Um, I was more concerned about my family and my business. Mm. That's going to be his defense. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> well, we're out of time for this segment. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the other cases that uh, might be pending, and we'll also talk about what could conceivably happen in the next several months. Uh, before this gets to trial, if it ever gets to trial. Oh, we'll yeah. be right back uh, after this. Welcome back to The Big Picture. My guest is Paul Cambria, and we're talking about the Trump indictment and uh, what might be happening going forward now. Um, Paul, what, uh, with all the things, the complications with the prosecution's case, what possibility is there that the judge might look at some of the weaknesses and out and out dismiss the case? Well, first, <coughs> first things first, you know, he was arraigned, he pled not guilty. Now 
he had they the prosecution has 35 days to give him the quote discovery under the new rules and under the new rules they have to give him everything they have to give him the grand jury testimony any notes interview reports whatever he'll have it all then the defense has the opportunity to make motions and i'm sure they're going to make a motion number one to strike that factual statement as being unfair and not only that that it doesn't comport with the rules number two they're going to challenge this as being out of time that the statute of limitations ran. Uh, three, uh, it seems to me they're going to say there's a violation of the right to be indicted by a grand jury because there's no identification of the, uh, the you know, the so-called fel the so-called crime <coughs> that are, makes this go up from a misdemeanor to a felony. Um, I do think that there's another thing that won't have an effect on the charges, but may have an effect on the prosecutor. And I think that they're going to complain and say that he violated the ethical rules in his press conference. There is a specific ethical rule that tells prosecutors what they can say and what they can't say. Mm -hmm. And the rule says that they have to say he's charged with X, bare bones, he's presumed innocent, and he has entered a plea of not guilty. And those last two were left out of that press conference yesterday. And not only that, that it is supposed to be just kind of a bare bones, here's the charge. And it really was a mini kind of summation on his part as to what he, you know, he did this, he did that, he did the other. One of the issues will be, has he prejudiced the venue? Should there be a change of venue? That only becomes ripe at jury selection, not pre-trial, at jury selection, when you listen to the answers. <clears throat> and if the juror, potential jurors say, well, I heard this, and after having heard that, I'm not sure I could put that out of my mind, and it could be that press conference and the statements of the prosecutor. And if there's enough prejudice shown, the venue then could be changed to Staten Island or some other place like that. So it could be changed up here, it could send it, you know, north. That really is the next thing. And then, of course, the motions to dismiss, as I indicated, that's the next step. Once those are all resolved, and your question was, do I think it could be dismissed? The best chance of dismissal is the statute of limitations and the lack of identifying the crime that was being furthered to make it a felony. Those are the best <clears throat> areas. <clears throat> it's pretty convoluted because the statute of limitations does not apply if there's a felony involved. No, no, I, no, no. There's always a statute of limitations. It's five years. It's, it's longer if there's a felony. It's five years. <clears throat> right? And then the question <clears throat> is, um, are there things that toll the five-year period? <clears throat> and they're going to say, yes, he was in Florida, that tolls it. And number two, we had a COVID situation where the court tolled all statutes of limitations because of the <clears throat> courts being closed down and things like that. <clears throat> so, yeah, the statute of limitations uh, definitely is going to be a big issue here. So, <clears throat> but there's arguments on both sides, which means the judge can kind of... Uh, use his discretion on that, basically? Well, no. The judge has to have a hearing and <clears> decide <throat> whether his <clears throat> the time that he was in Florida is subtracted. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, that's going to be one of the situations. Um, where the COVID time will be subtracted, and then they'll come up with a time. <clears throat> and if it exceeds five years, the <clears throat> statute's shot. I, I'm sure that the prosecutor figured between COVID and being in Florida, that his statute's okay. Hmm. The other cases, if you're familiar with, um, there's a couple of other investigations going on. Um, the, the, the fact that this particular investigation came to be uh, before a judge first seems to be a little bit odd since this is arguably the least serious <clears throat> I would think, in the least um, of all in terms of strength of any of the 
potential cases that are being talked about. Is is this is that really the case in terms of everything that you've heard? Well, two things. <clears throat> uh, on the state side, <clears throat> uh, the prior prosecutor, prior district attorney passed on these charges. And now we have this district attorney filing the charges. So that plays into the politics the argument. On the federal side, where there was discussions about violating federal campaign laws, <clears throat> the feds passed on prosecution. Uh, and from what we've heard, uh, you know, it doesn't seem that that's going to be revived. Now, apparently there's something going on in Georgia that they're looking at from his standpoint. But the fact that a former prosecutor in New York passed mm -hmm. and this current prosecutor prosecuted you know, feeds right into this thing that is political. Well, that's the other thing is this this is a state prosecutor or a city prosecutor in New state, York City. He's state. state. Yeah. <clears throat> and he's he's basically going after what would have been a federal offense. Maybe. See, he didn't identify what the <clears throat> felony is that raises it to a a felony level or what the crime is that raises it to a felony level. He, in his discussion yesterday, made it sound like it could either be election law violations or it might be a tax violation. Hmm. But he hasn't named either one. <laughs> well, I think what, what, part of what he's saying is that Trump paid hush money to Stormy Daniels so that she, so he wouldn't be uh, embarrassed. Lose the election. You know, well, so that she wouldn't say that they had an affair. Hush money in a non-disclosure agreement, okay, so that it wouldn't come out that they had an affair. The, the very definition of a non-disclosure agreement is basically, I guess that's hush money. I mean, well, but it, see, it, but hush it's a legal money is version. Not, it's not illegal. But, right, that's a legal but, no, way. No, it's not illegal unless... <clears throat> as they want to prove here, that is, it is to affect an election, okay? If it's just to satisfy the family and not embarrass them, it's not a crime. It's only if it affects another crime. And here they're saying it is basically violating the election laws because it's paying money in furtherance of an election it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't a lot of these payments come after the election? Well, but the question is, was the deal made before the election? You know, so they could just <laughs> ladder it out and pay her later. But if the deal was, don't say anything until the election is over and here's the money, you know, that doesn't matter. But his defense will be, it was just, you know, not to embarrass my family. It had nothing to do with the election. They have to prove that it either was a tax violation or it was an election violation, and they haven't identified which one they want to use. That's why this indictment has a problem. And and basically, they have to improve intent. Isn't that a difficult Yeah, well, bar? sure. But intent to what? Intent to influence the election. He's right. going to say, no, my intent was to not embarrass my family. So it's not a violation. It's, it doesn't affect another crime. Yeah, it, that's kind of a high bar, isn't it? To, to, to well, I'm not so sure about thinking? that because Cohen uh, already testified in the past that the money was paid to avoid embarrassment. Well, now you know he's going to change his testimony because he hates Trump's guts. Right. Trump <laughs> got him prosecuted. So, you know, he's going to say whatever. There's another little twist to it. In New York, if you are a, quote, accomplice, which he clearly would be, there must be independent evidence to corroborate what you say. Federal government's a little different. State government, our laws, require independent corroboration. What form would that? Well, it could be anything that <clears throat> tends to show what he's saying is true. A document, for mm -hmm. example, an email. Uh, you know, something like that. Well, that, that would prove that a transaction took place, but it wouldn't prove intent. Well, it depends what's in the email. Okay. We can't lose this election. Make sure you okay. get her and pay her. You know, <laughs> okay. that kind of thing. 
Well, uh, that's, you know, that's how hmm. these things go. And there is an email that there that references the election. So that may, you know, be loom large here. So uh, what's the next step then in this process? There's, there's various motions that are going to be going next on. Step the next step is they get their discovery, mm -hmm. and then, then they file their motions. Then they have argument on the motions. Then the judge decides if they need testimony on the motions. Then they submit their briefs, and then the judge makes a decision. Okay, we've got about a minute left. Your expert opinion. We're getting into the the prognostication. Right. <laughs> Let's. What would you predict is going to be the outcome of this? Well, I think they're going to have issues with the indictment itself for all the reasons that I indicated. Whether this judge will act on them, who knows? Uh, in the if he if he does, great. There'll be a dismissal. There'll be an appeal, and you know they'll they'll get involved in the appeal. In the end. Something's going to survive, I think, and it's going to go to trial. And his defense will be, I was protecting my family and my business. <clears throat> and how long will this process potentially last? Would it last into the, the process where the actual election is taking place? Well, it's possible. I mean, I don't think it's going to be done by November. I don't see that. Mm. Um, you know, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, they could fast track it. Maybe it could be done by then. But usually there are other criminal cases that have been waiting. Uh, COVID slowed that down. So there's a backlog and they should go first. But who knows? Maybe they'll fast track this thing and get it tried okay. before uh, November. Well, we live in interesting times. No doubt. No okay, doubt. well, we're out of time in this big picture. Um, I'd like to thank Paul Cambria for being my guest, and I'm sure <clears throat> we will be doing this again because this story is going to be ongoing. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting case, and with Donald Trump, nothing is ever dull. So sure. <laughs> I want to thank you for watching The Big Picture. Thank you for watching WVBZ TV. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on The Big Picture.